and we are live. Uh, welcome uh, to this latest episode of Totally Unscripted. So uh, I'm joined um, as as usual by Steve Webster. Hi, Steve. Hello. And we're also delighted to have uh, Eric Galida here from uh, G, G Suite Developer Re Relations. Hi, Eric. Hello. Thanks for having me. So, Eric, um, I'm sure uh, your your name and face will be familiar to uh, a number of our um, our our community uh, and your longtime contribution to Google Apps Script. And today we're we're hoping to pick your brain around um, uh, Google Apps Script uh, verification and also publication of add-ons. So some things have changed recently. Um, I think one of the kind of big headlines is obviously with Project Strobe, uh, we're kind of phasing in some new changes around um, verification and security, uh, but there have been some other changes, obviously, around uh, Gmail in terms of access. So we thought it'd be useful just to kind of get up or kind of find out kind of the things that you're seeing or regularly tripping people up and um, finding out some of the answers. Just to say that the um, YouTube chat is open and also we've got the Q&A. Uh, I've shared a link in there. So if you've got any questions, um, I'll more than happy to pass those on to Eric as we go along. So, Eric, what kind of are the kind of the big talking points that you're you're seeing around this area? Sure. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. Uh, it'll be ten years at Google for me this July. So I, <laughs> I I've been with the AppScript community probably for the last seven. So uh, it's been you know it's always changing and uh, there's more change as you mentioned recently. And so happy to talk about that. Um, so yeah, the two things that, that have changed a bit are OAuth verification and our publication of add-ons. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, just a little bit of background on what, what's been going on there before we dive into some questions. Um, so we, we made some announcements a while back about OAuth verification for what were called sensitive scopes. So when you have any application that accesses Google user data, you need to specify which scopes the, to prompt the user for access to. Those scope codes get translated into words on an approval page saying, like, access your files, et cetera. Uh, and then the user clicks authorize. That's kind of the OAuth 2 flow that all applications use to access user data. And we started deeming that some of those scopes are a bit more sensitive than others. They provide access to data that can be very personal to the user. Um, and we want to have a little bit more um, insight into how scopes are being used and by whom. And so when you have a scope that you uh, want to present to the user, the Google Cloud Console will show you a little notification as you put that scope into the configuration screen saying, hey, this is a sensitive scope. You're going to need to be verified. And our verification process involves um, reaching out to various, uh, uh, going, going through a process where there's some communication about what your application is trying to do, what ways it's going to access data, is there perhaps a, a more limited scope you can ask for that provides the, the access you need, et cetera. And so that verification process takes place for these sensitive scopes. Um, you know, how long it takes varies a bit about you know, the back and forth and then what goes on there, but it's not, it's not super intrusive. And that's been live for a while now. So I think many uh, add-on developers or app developers may be used to that sensitive scope verification. Um, an analogy, perhaps, it's like the, the phone screen that you get maybe before you go for an on-site interview. It's, it's a little bit lighter in touch, kind of getting a sense of who you are and what you're doing with the information. Uh, did you have a question there? No, no. OK, cool. <laughs> so uh, then more recently, we launched uh, what, what publicly we're calling Project Strobe, which was a, an even more in-depth look at how certain scopes really are uh, contain even even more sensitive data. And so what we've labeled these scopes restricted scopes. Uh, and these restricted scopes require an even more in-depth process of evaluation. So more like the moving on to the on-site interview, let's say, if we're going to use an analogy. Um, and so this, this process, uh, we, we've detailed it on a, a blog post. We also have a number of resources going into all of this verification stuff. But it's a more in-depth process that has a, a greater set of criteria and may also involve a security audit to make sure that user data is handled safely. Um, and so that okay. new process is, is what's rolling out like, as we speak. Like the dates have, so there were some key dates, I believe, earlier this year in March and May, and then some other key dates coming later in June and July. And so that's kind of 
when we're talking about OAuth verification in the zeitgeist right now, we're most often talking about this, this newer project strobe sensitive scope process. The uh, restricted scopes, um, that does not apply if you are within your own enterprise or business domain, correct? Yeah, so the question is like, um, what happens if you don't go through this process, right? That's kind of, if you go through this process, then anyone in the world can uh, approve these scopes. They're, they're available to anyone. But if you don't go through the process, then what, what happens? And so uh, you actually don't need to go through the process if the only people, uh, if you are developing an internal application. How you market internal application is that it has to be attached to an organization inside of your GCP console. So if you've ever used the, the cloud console, when you create a project, it can either be kind of floating in a, in a general pool, or it can be attached to kind of a, a domain, like a G Suite domain. Um, if it's one of those attached, if it's attached to a domain and you check a box saying that this is, or a radio button saying this is an internal application, then you don't, uh, you don't have to go through the verification process. Um, and there, I think there are other cases where you perhaps wouldn't have to. So for instance, uh, if you don't go through the verification process, you're capped at 100 users. But if it's a personal project for home hacking, um, that's fine. You have one user, <laughs> it's just you. Um, or maybe it's just something small for you and a team that you're working on. Um, maybe then you say, well, I only have 100 users, that's okay. So uh, th I think there are some cases where you wouldn't need to go through verification, internal apps or for just uh, kind of uh, relatively small usage just for yourself or a team, personal projects, um, you wouldn't need to go through the verification steps. I think verification is really aimed at applications that are going for wide distribution, trying to get over 100 users. And I think you know even moderately popular apps would probably hope to get over 100 users uh, in their lifetime. <laughs> hmm. so we've just got a question from Easel. Is there a difference between sensitive scopes and restricted scopes? Yes, they are very different. Uh, it's a very different set. So the restricted scope set is rather large. Um, and then when you enter a scope into the, the console consent screen page, it'll throw a flag up if it's sensitive. Um, but you can expect that you know many G Suite related scopes are, se are sensitive. Uh, they do require this, this kind of um, light review of the uh, uh, verification process. The restricted scopes are, are very narrow and they are documented on what is a, a very key page if you're trying to understand any of this, which is the OAuth API verification FAQ. Uh, it is uh, hosted in our cloud platform uh, help documentation. So there we have listed the specific uh, restricted right. scopes. And it's a small number of Gmail and recently announced drive scopes as well. Um, two different timelines on those. So the Gmail scopes and the restricted reviews are happening for, like right now. And the drive we just announced, I believe last week, that those are coming in early 2020. So um, there, there are two different sets of scopes, Gmail and Drive, and they are on slightly different timelines, but those are the current set of restricted scopes. Yeah, I think that covers that. Uh, we'll uh, also include some links in the show notes so that we can direct people off to the right pages as well. Yeah, if you're looking for good key resources, I would definitely recommend that OAuth verification FAQ. It's extremely comprehensive and they're keeping it up to date. Um, there's also another page for uh, called Unverified Apps that talks a little bit about the app, the screen you will see if your app hasn't been verified yet, and send some of the consequences of being unverified, like the user cap. That's all categorized there. Um, there's also the Google API Services User Data Policy. That's where a lot of the details are about um, you know the specific scopes and policies around uh, restricted scopes. Um, and those kind of represent, I think, the three kind of top resources you're going to want to look at uh, if you want to understand this problem area. Hey, Eric, uh, we've also seen some questions about, uh, let's say you're using UR, URL fetch, and that's the external scope, I suppose. Uh, could you bring clarity on um, when that may also cause a flag for deeper audits? Yeah, I, I do want to just state up front, uh, and I, I should have mentioned this sooner. I am not on the team that uh, created these policies or enforces them. So I, I am, I'm here as a representative of developer relations. We try to bridge the gap between external developers and people at Google. And so I'm doing my, giving you my best understanding, but really the canonical resources for these are the documentation and the people you interact with during the verification process. Um, but in regards to uh, what you mentioned there, what you're referring to is there's a, there's a clause in the FAQ that says, uh, 
First, the secure handling policy, what are local client applications and when will they be exempt from security assessments? And so it does talk about this concept of a local client applications are those that only run, store and process data on a user's device um, without the ability to transmit it outwards. So uh, AppScript is entirely hosted in the cloud. As we all know, there's cloud editor, cloud runtime, cloud storage of code, cloud properties, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, what does it mean to be a local client when nothing is local on your machine is a, a complicated topic area for sure. Um, like I said, my understanding is that if you do include some app script services or scopes that have the ability to transmit data outwards, that could put you at, uh, could make it so that you no longer count as a local client. So um, if you have the URL fetch scope, it means you have the ability to make HTTP requests outbound from your script, which means information has the ability to leave your script environment. Um, so, you know, I think if you, you know, it, it really depends upon the review that's taking place or how, the, how you're going to fall into that clause. But certainly, if you have the ability to transmit information, I think you kind of are no longer a local client at that point. But I said, I refer to the people who are doing the review for more details. But I think as a guideline, um, you know, if, if you have that ability to transmit information, um, at least in my view, you're kind of no longer have the idea that you only run or store or process data on the local device it is not, or in the AppScript environment isn't really going to be uh, probably true anymore. Okay, thank you. Uh, another thing that was talked about in some of our forums is the use of leveraging the Google uh, Drive Picker uh, to, to help to not worry about this broad restricted scope. Yeah, so we just announced Drive having a new set of restricted scopes. So there's a, a Drive scope that says full access to everything in your Drive, read and write, right? It's a very powerful scope. Um, and one of the recommendations is if you can, just you know, for, for all of these restricted scopes, the main recommendation is try not to use a restricted scope. If, if your use case can be accomplished without a restricted scope, it's a lot easier, it's better for users, it's simpler for you to not use a restricted scope. So for instance, if you want to provide a functionality that allows someone to upload a file from Drive, asking for permission to every Drive file they have is a little overkill, um, when instead we have some technologies like the Drive File Picker that allow you to present a UI to the user where they can select the one file that they actually want your application to access. Um, and then there's a drive.file scope that ties in with the picker that allows you to just access files that have been accessed via the picker. So um, the picker for Drive represents, uh, not for every use case, but for many, a way that you can still maintain the functionality you want without having to request a scope that is restricted. Uh, just a follow up on that. I know uh, from a perspective of coding, a folder and file is kind of treated the same way. Uh, so if the if the uh, picker is used and they say select a folder, which could contain files associated as a label to that, you foresee a problem of just selecting a folder and those four or five files will, will be uh, accepted, or would that be a file picker where no, I need to I need to have a, a picker experience per file rather than per folder. Yeah, I don't recall offhand the picker's behavior on folders. Um, I could imagine I, I could imagine a case in which we don't um, treat folders the way that you'd expect. Like we don't once you pick a folder, give you access to all the files within that folder. Um, that's something we can evaluate in more detail. Like you know, there's there's um, obviously a bit of attention there because what if someone moves a file into a folder later? Did they actually intend to share that with the application? It could be ambiguous. So I think it's a case we'd have to look at carefully if it's not already supported. Um, but you know, certainly if, if we're coming to rely more on the picker to work around uh, or to be an alternative to restricted scopes, I think we can certainly, um, there's a lot of value in making the picker experience more featureful to accommodate a, a broader array of use cases. Okay. Uh, another thought, uh, with the restricted scopes going from uh, now with email, and now, as we just mentioned, there's some now with Google Drive, do you foresee it going somewhere else, calendar or contacts? Uh, well, that's a fair question. I, I'm not part of that team, so I don't know where they're going. Um, you know, all I can tell you is where they've been, which is Gmail and Drive. I think, you know, at least me personally, in my personal life, Gmail and Drive have my most sensitive information, so I'm, I'm glad that they were some of the first ones tackled. They have password reset emails. I keep a lot of financial information in my drive. So, uh, you know, I think those were, are, are certainly good, important uh, first areas to tackle when it comes to data privacy. Uh, but I, I can't say where they're going, unfortunately. That's fine. Okay, thanks. 
so obviously with the the new drive file scope this, this you know google made the announcement that this change is coming but they're, they're giving time for developers to um you know update their code and so on um one of the questions i saw that come up in the forum was around um downgrading your you know the scope within your project and doing that in a um uh, in a kind of a very user-friendly way. Is there something more about that you can talk to? Yeah, one of the areas some developers have had some troubles with is how to do the migration, right? So essentially, during, during a period of time where, uh, there's a period of time by which if you've started the verification process but haven't completed yet, it kind of lets you hold on to your grandfathered verification or your grandfathered scopes, right? You were using the scope for years. If you're still in the process of verification, you can hold on to it uh, until the verification is complete. But um, th there are some challenges when you're trying to move from like, let's say you had a broad scope, you realized you could use a narrow scope. How do you kind of migrate from broad to narrow? Um, I have seen some people run into some, some tricky cases there. I think the key is uh, move slow uh, and get exact details from the team that you're communicating with, the verification team, because th there is just a lot of complexity when it comes to how the systems check whether or not you are asked for, for a scope. And there are just some actions you can take in the UI that if you know you click a certain button, you could end up losing access and then not be able to easily roll back again. So I would say go be slow, be deliberate, and, and kind of follow the exact directions from the team. I think I've seen some well-meaning developers kind of say, oh, I did this for this one project, so I'll just go ahead and apply it to my other two projects, even though those right. aren't at the right step in the verification process. And by kind of jumping the gun, they've put themselves into a, a tough situation. So I would certainly be, be deliberate and uh, be very careful with some of these migration, just because um, taking a wrong step here can trigger you to fall into an edge case you know, where you kind of don't have your old scopes, you don't have your new scopes yet, and, and that's not a great position to be in. I think, um, so we've, uh, another question then from from Tim. So the the other option around some of the scopes was just to um, you could use the only current doc um, just to to limit the you know the access to the, the individual doc document slide or or spreadsheet. Um, so that's been uh, a valuable uh, tool for me. It's required some thinking about how some of my script projects work, but it's meant that I've avoided having to go through verification. Um, Tim was asking, uh, to what degree can uh, the spreadsheets current only be used with advanced Google services and the REST API? So um, if you're using uh, Google Sheets as an advanced service, sure. can you reuse those tokens or? Yeah. So. For background, for people who aren't aware, um, in AppScript, there's like a, a magical JS doc annotation at current doc only or only current doc. I can't ever remember the order yeah. of the three, the three tokens there. Um, but if you include that uh, that JS doc annotation, it says rather than use the default scope associated with uh, spreadsheets or docs, for instance, use a current only scope, where current only says only the um, doc or spreadsheet that the script is attached to if it's bound or only the one that it's being run on if it's an add-on. Um, so I think with now with the app script manifest, you can probably just do that scope change manually without the annotation, but in a pre-manifest world, this was the only way to trigger it. And so what's nice about it is that it's, you know, from a user point of view, it's saying this add-on wants to access the docs that you open it on, right? Which is great, not, not every doc that happens to be sitting in your drive. Um, but yeah, the, the challenge with that today is how how the backend knows which doc is open, right? So uh, when you're using the REST API, this concept of open doesn't exist, right? So how how does a REST API know what is open in your browser? It really doesn't have that in, that context. And so today, these current only scopes are not compatible with the REST APIs because there's no safe way to transmit what's currently open in the user's um, browser. It's not technologically infeasible. And in fact, if you have ever worked with the, the Android add-ons that existed for a time being, or, or maybe still exist in a deprecated state today, those Android add-ons had some ability to take like a contextual token that was passed to it and then kind of forward it along to the execution API. Um, so you could imagine that it could be possible to build out 
this infrastructure, but we're not there yet. I think you know one of the things that these verification projects have done is kind of really kickstart a very lively set of discussions around how can we provide even more fine-grained access and enable use cases with fine-grained scopes. And so I know a number of different people and teams who are working towards um, opening up more of these avenues so that, you know, it used to be before, rather than struggle through some of these edge cases, you just requested the full scope and you just moved on. Yeah. As a developer, it was always easier to ask for a broad scope. Um, and I think now knowing that there's a higher demand for these narrow scopes, we're trying to figure out how can we empower these narrow scopes throughout our stack. And so uh, it's something that we're talking about a lot of areas. And I think these current only scopes would be something else we'd wanna look into how can we make these current only scopes valid in the advanced services and other contexts. That's great. So do do we want to perhaps go on to the kind of the add-on publication process? There have been some changes around here around um, going from uh, the Chrome Web Store to the marketplace. Yeah, another um, change that's happening live right now as we speak. <laughs> um, yeah, so one key thing is that uh, if you're publishing an add-on, you do want to go through the verification process ahead of the add-on publication process. Um, they, there is a dependency there where I believe the the add-on review team will not review your add-on until it's, the scopes have been verified by the verification process. So do kick that one off first uh, before moving on to the add-on publication. Um, so yeah, add-ons traditionally have been um, published to the Chrome Web Store. This was never because they are Chrome extensions. They are not Chrome extensions. That is a point of confusion. Uh, it's more like we were using the Chrome Web Store's infrastructure of a storefront uh, the ability to create listings and do installs. We were using that infrastructure uh, in order to kind of manage add-ons. Um, it was never a great fit. You know, if you if you changed certain values in your config, you all of a sudden your add-on would turn into a Chrome Chrome extension. And there were some wonky edge cases I've helped people support through in the past. Um, and so now what we're really trying to do is make uh, the G Suite marketplace the new canonical home for add-on publication, as well as other sorts of uh, G Suite integrations. This is enabled because a couple of years back, G Suite Marketplace shifted from being a place where only admins can install applications for their whole domain to now the G Suite Marketplace is also available to end users to install uh, app integrations and applications one at a time. So we are in this process of migrating from the Chrome Web Store to the G Suite Marketplace. And right now we're in that time where we're not completely off the old one and not completely on the new one yet. And so unfortunately what that means is that publishing an add-on right now does require even more steps than it did before and even more steps than it will in the future because you have to publish to both locations. So uh, I, I last ran through this ahead of my next demo. I, uh, my next talk, I gave a pr presentation at Google Cloud Next where I had an add-on kind of helped me do the presentation and I wanted to publish that add-on just within a test domain but have it published so that I didn't rely on the test as add-on feature. And yeah, you, at least at that time, which I believe is still true today, you have to do the full Chrome Web Store publication followed by the full G, market, G Suite Marketplace publication, or at least most of the G Suite Marketplace publication flow. Um, and so yeah, it is a bit, uh, it is a bit tough. Um, the reason is, is that we're trying to get the G Suite Marketplace fully populated for when we do cut over. But at the moment, the you know get add-ons menu in Sheets or Docs is still sourced by the Chrome Web Store, and so. Uh, you do want to have your add-on in both in order to like be available to users now, but also be available to users soon when we we cut over to the G Suite Marketplace completely. Um, and one other clarification I make here is that this migration is for Docs, Sheets, Forms, and Slides add-ons. So we're calling them editor add-ons in our documentation now. Uh, Gmail add-ons, which have launched a while ago, those have always been published through the Chrome Web uh, through the G Suite Marketplace and never touched Chrome Web Store. Um, and so they're not affected by this migration. Um, I've got a question just in from, so thanks for that, Eric. Uh, oh, actually, Steve, was there anything else you wanted that, to add into the, the add-on debate? Yeah, I guess one question. I've seen someone ask a while ago, Eric, about going from the Chrome Web Store, perhaps they had five stars and all these nice reviews. And they're concerned about losing that and not showing up on the G Suite marketplace. Is that something that's on the plate to, to look at? Yeah, I know the team that is doing this migration has spent a lot of effort in trying to migrate over install records, reviews, and uh, ratings. 
they they do know how important those are to add-on publishers. That's you know part of their um, the credibility they've built up over time in the ecosystem is ha but is measured in, in in those terms. And so they have done a lot of work to migrate those over. I know that the details get very tricky, um, especially in cases where because there are some edge cases uh, that exist in this migration that are really tricky. So it's possible to have two add-ons share a GCP console project, but be published with a Chrome web store twice. And that's not possible once you move to the G Suite marketplace. And so if, if, you, if you happen to run into these edge cases, there might be some challenges with your uh, ratings and reviews. But in the normal case where you created a script, hit publish, have an add-on, uh, we are moving over your ratings and reviews. And so I, I know the team has put a lot of work into getting that right. Um, you know, th There might be still some cases where if you notice a discrepancy, it's worth kind of calling that out and uh, and reporting that to us. Um, but I know it's something they put a lot of work into. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I can jump into uh, Faustino's question. So um, back to the external requests and um, uh, uh, app scripts, uh, restricted incentive scope. So is do you, do you know if hitting the external request is only a problem when you're using restricted scopes, or is it same um, if you're also using uh, sensitive scopes? Yeah, so this local client um, clause is in the FAQ under security assessment. And the security assessment only comes into play for restricted scopes. So uh, if you are not using restricted scopes, then you will you are not you know, potentially subject to the security assessment, which means you therefore are not subject to the local client clause. So if you're just using a sensitive scope or a, a non-sensitive scope, um, then you can, there's no issue with using the, uh, the URL fetch and the external data access. The, the intersection here is sensitive scopes plus um, uh, URL fetch is where yeah. we start to deal with the complexity around that local client applications clause. I actually have a follow-up on that. Um, what what about the external is within the Google GCP umbrella, uh, Firebase, for example? Uh, do you think that may matter uh, if it's still flagged? Um, yeah, like I said, I, I can't speak to particulars here about what's going to happen, but I do know that the URL fetch app scope, that external request scope, the scope itself doesn't limit your application to any set of URLs. So what you may be doing in your script now is different than what that scope allows. Um, and so I think a, a lot of when we're talking about scopes and looking at scopes, it's about what does that scope allow? Because knowing that application code can change at any time, uh, what does that scope allow? And so the URL fetch scope allows you to access any URL, uh, even if it's not Firebase. And so even if you just happen to be using Firebase today, um, that there's no way to encode that in the mm -hmm. scope. There's no scope which is URL fetch app to Firebase domain only, right? Okay. I, I, I think in the manifest, you, there is uh, the option to to, to whitelist the, the URLs. Yeah, so uh, Gmail, Gmail add-ons brought in this concept of whitelisted URLs. Um, I've always been a little challenged on how those work. Mm. <laughs> I've been a little fuzzy, um, I'll admit. Uh, I do know that if you want to like create an open link, so you want to have your Gmail add-on sidebar have a button that opens a URL. I think you need to have the URLs whitelisted for that to work. Yeah. I'm not sure how it ties into URL fetch app, um, uh, if at all. So I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that. But it, I don't. I think I do not believe that that whitelist applies to docs add-ons or regular app scripts or app script web apps, etc. Yeah, I think my experience was when I did include whitelist in other, other non-Gmail project projects that. Um, if I did try and hit a URL that wasn't whitelisted, it it it, it failed. So I, I think it wow. is okay. It it is read um, in other projects, um, but as you say, I think it's primarily being um, developed for Gmail. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll dig into the details there. See what the uh, mm. how, that, how that works in non Gmail cases. Um, so Easel, um, just. Going back on to um, add-ons and um, uh, kind of you know, the, the work around those, um, do you know if there are any plans to promote add-ons in the future? Um, 
I'm not entirely sure what Easel, uh, I guess, kind of making a bigger storefront. I'd, <laughs> sure. Maybe easy. Yeah, I mean, obviously, one of the things we talked about at Cloud Next, uh, and it's been very popular, I've been working on it here internally, is G Suite add-ons, our, our next evolution of the add-ons framework. Uh, it's kind of taking a lot of the concepts that you we've built out for Gmail add-ons and bringing them to other uh, G Suite applications and allowing you to write one add-on that works across multiple G Suite applications. Um, so if you've if you've used the sidebar in various uh, Google properties, G Suite properties that has, lets you open calendar and tasks and keep kind of alongside your your Gmail or calendar, the idea is to introduce third party applications into that same task pane space. Um, so that's, that's a big effort we're undergoing right now. We, we're talking about it at Next. We're working with partners right now and some of those demoed at Next as well. Um, you know, so that, that is a, a definitely a new front for add-ons and one that I can imagine we are, are going to continue to promote as it reaches GA. Um, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like though. Mm. Um, we've, we've seen with some of the uh, you know, with Gmail and uh, Hangouts chat that, you know, they've gone to a card-based service. Uh, do, for the editor add-ons, or do you see that as kind of where, where they'll go in the future as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, the, the card service, uh, it comes with certain pros and cons. Obviously, uh, you have a bit less expression. You can't like, control every, every square bit pixel of the uh, sidebar. Um, but one of the things that is really nice about it is it allows us to uh, let the UIs work seamlessly inside the mobile clients. So Gmail add-ons, for instance, work inside the Gmail Android app, and uh, that's something we was a lot more difficult to, to pull off with uh, arbitrary HTML and JavaScript. So you know, the, the, there are some pros and cons there. With G Suite add-ons, we are uh, going with a card-based interface. Um, and we made it clear that the, the launch of G Suite add-ons does not apply anything for the existing doc sheets, forms, and slides add-ons that exist. We're not uh, making any changes to that stack right now. Um, you know, I, I could definitely see a case where if if the development of cards and card-based UIs becomes more popular, we, we might have demand to bring that into mm -hmm. uh, doc sheets and forms and slides as well. Um, so we'll we'll have to see as that goes. But at the moment. Um, we're planning to leave the existing add-on stack, the editor add-on stack, pretty much intact uh, with no changes. But it's not to say that we, we won't respond to the uh, the demands or the, the wishes of the community. Um, Andy's asking, you, do you know if there's an ETA for Gmail add-ons in uh, iOS? I don't know the Gmail add-ons iOS story now. So I, I don't have any mm. details there. Um, I haven't been following that as closely as I should be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly, um, my experience of, you know, developing editor add-ons is, you know, once you've got the core functionality there, you, you end up spending a hell of a lot of time actually doing kind of HTML, JavaScript churning. So I, for one, would be um, <laughs> very grateful for a card service where you can just, um, you know, call these from, from from an object file. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, we certainly find that many um, developers who use App Script, who don't come from like a professional software web development background, they, they do find it a lot easier to construct UIs and card service. We handle things like accessibility for you and making sure it works on multiple browsers. And so uh, you do get to take a lot off your plate if you, if you don't already have a deep expertise in that uh, web stack. Yeah. Um, I think that's all the, the questions we got in. Uh, Steve, would any kind of follow-ups you, you had? Nope, that's it. Cool. Um, uh, it's just on the, since I got you here for a second, um, for the, yes, the auth verification. So I, I do know that, like, you know, I have, I've talked to certain developers on the App Script forum as well as on Twitter that have had problems with the process. I think it is a, a relatively new process, and uh, you know we use emails to go back and forth. Sometimes things can get lost in the shuffle. Um, you know, so we are working to improve the process. Uh, so if if you have any feedback on the process, there's actually a public email address you can send an email to. 
um, it's kind of a, a place for us to listen to the community, not necessarily uh, respond. And it's listed in our FAQ, but it's oauth-feedback at google.com. Um, so if, if you're running into some trouble, if you have a, a comment you'd like to send about ways to improve the process, I know the team is very eager to um, to, to get your feedback and, uh, and hopefully make it a smoother process for everybody. Uh, because, you know, no developer loves process, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, we'd all rather write code than do process. And so we're looking to uh, try to smooth out the corners here as much as we can. And, and even since the process launched, it's gotten a lot better. So it used to be, I think, a form inside of a help page to kick off the process. Now it's integrated directly into the console. You can get visibility of your current verification status. And so the, the team has been making a, a number of improvements there. And there's um, there's more areas we'd like to, to, to improve on. But anyway, I just want to put it out to the community that you're your feedback is welcome and appreciated. We'll um, also include that. I think Alan Wells was um, encouraged me to put um, a kind of the best of the community uh, document together. So we, um, that was certainly one of the areas where there's, there's been quite a lot of discussion. Um, so um, if you're not familiar, uh, uh, the Google Apps Script has merged with the, um, the editor add-ons community from Google Plus into Google Groups, so we'll um, we'll promote a, a link into there. So um, ho hopefully you can find this in our new home, um, where there's a very rich discussion going on already, and there's a lot of um, really useful posts that people are um, you know coming up with great questions, but also sharing some of the answers uh, that they're coming up with as well. So we'll um, include links there. Is there yeah. anything? else that has recently caught your eye from from that community that um, has caught your interest or is there um, uh, projects or work that you're you're kind of aware of that you're uh, following with interest uh, yeah I mean I, I guess at first of all, I want to give a plus one to uh, our new Google Apps Script community uh, not to make a bad pun there, but <laughs> I've been happy to see that um, you know our active Google Plus community has a lot of folks have moved over to Google Groups and have continued to stay together. Uh, and uh, you know I've actually been more active on the community since we've moved over. Just um, I think I kind of you know got back on my radar a bit, and so uh, I've really enjoyed kind of getting uh, some more direct feedback, seeing what people go through, and then being able to engage with some of you all more directly. So thanks to everyone who helped kind of. Um, Make that migration possible for our existing user base. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't say I notice any any major trends or have any particular hot areas I've been following. Um, like I said, for me, you know, in developer relations, our goal is to uh, both advocate to external developers and on behalf of external developers. So we're trying to bring you the latest and greatest news from Google, but also to take your feedback and bring it back into the people who um, build the products that you use and love. Um, and you know, getting getting a place where I can kind of get a read on what people are feeling, what they're building, problems they run into. It's uh, it's definitely invaluable for us to have that um, that channel, uh, like I said, for communicating outwards. But for me, I really like learning what everybody's doing and seeing um, what are the trends that pop up, what are some areas that could use improvement. And so, um, you know, I, I recently kind of did a, a deep dive into OAuth verification to kind of learn as much as I could. And that was spurred on by all the questions I got mm. that were asked in the community. And so, you know, knowing knowing that that's a hot topic allows me to kind of focus my efforts internally. And uh, you know, our team is working with the verification team to you know take the feedback we hear and address it. And so, having that as a raw source is really useful. Um, you know, not every comment results in change. That's the way the way it goes. Yeah. Um, but certainly, it's it's a great start to kind of turn our eyes in the right direction, know what's causing trouble, what's working well, and then uh, kind of make the decisions based off that. Well, um, well, thank you for your your time, Eric. Um, it's, it's been great to have you on and, and talking about this area. Um, and um, for our community, you, you you know, if you you post the good question in the uh, Google Plus, uh, sorry, in the uh, new Google group, Google group, you might get catch Eric's eye, and yeah. uh, he might be able to help you out with something. Um, I suppose. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was, I was just going to say, uh, you can also reach me on Twitter, too. I, I do respond to people who tweet at me. Um, I'm not the most active person on Twitter, <laughs> but I, I, I do use it. And so um, at Eric Kalita, if you want to uh, reach out with a question or a uh, comment. And haven't you also started blogging a, a little bit more? I have. I got into blogging. I mean, like most people who blog, 
sometimes you start out with a really high <laughs> intentions and then it drops off quickly. Um, I got two though. I think getting getting your second post is important. The first <laughs> one is the second one is hard. So um, yeah, I'm, I am trying to get back into uh, uh, into blogging again. And so uh, do look out for me on Medium as well. But I'll I'll I tweet out my blog posts as well. Uh, I've done one on uh, one on an app script I built. Uh, and then another one on using Sheets as a database. So, uh, so I think it was the was that the calendar slot? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a, a treadmill just down the hall that way that I uh, I like to a walking treadmill, walking desk that I like to use, and I I built a little booking system for it just to kind of um, simplify a daily task. And so, it, you know, it kind of highlighted one of my favorite things about AppScript, which is just like yeah. I, I can go from a problem and a, and a nugget of an idea in my head to something that works in just record time. And so, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by some of the most complex systems and technologies this world has seen. But, you know, when you have a small personal problem, I find AppScript to be the, the, the perfect tool for me. Well, um, to kind of help kind of spread these little stories and little snippets and uh, little kind of how to's, um, I've revived uh, an old Twitter account I've, I've been running. So, um, if you look out for AppScript info, um, we're, um, I'm kind of curating and looking for stuff. So if you tag it with Google AppScript or G Suite devs, um, I'll, I'll be able to pick it up and retweet it. So hopefully we'll get more kind of sharing within the community. Yeah, um, I've, I've been I've been following that and and and, and retweeting or tweeting uh, what, what's going on there. I I mean another great resource if you want to keep out is we have all of these Google Developer Experts of which of which you are a, a subset. Um, you know these are people in the external community that uh, have have gone through a process to say like I I know what I'm talking about when it comes to uh, G Suite development or App Script development, and uh, we have a really a growing community there of of wonderful people that uh, post a lot of. Uh, you know, interesting, cool, useful things they've done with with AppScript or G Suite technologies. I believe there was just a a post earlier this week about uh, soccer. I don't know. I didn't. <laughs> I don't know enough about soccer, but help, helping helping with a, some some soccer league uh, and and using G Suite technologies for that. So uh, another good resource to follow. Well, thanks thanks again, Eric, for your time. So um, we haven't got a date for our next show, but hopefully it'll it is continuing the theme. So we're hoping to talk about um, Google Apps Script in the enterprise. Um, so G Suite enterprise kind of focus. Um, it's an area where um, we're conscious that there's a lot of work going on, but um, sometimes it's it, just because of the practicalities of the enterprise, it's not very visible sometimes. So we're hoping to get that together pretty soon. So we'll publicize that um, on the usual channels on our website and uh, on the the Twitter account as well. Uh, so thanks also to Steve for um, joining me in and uh, uh, helping me quiz Eric on this one. And uh, thanks again, Eric, and we'll hopefully, hopefully see you all very soon. Great, thank you.